<laughs> That's the favorite part of Calvary Chapel, this countdown. Well, we want to thank the Lord that he has drawn everyone here tonight. Um, so let's lift him up because he is worthy of our praises and worthy of our worship. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for drawing us here today by your Spirit, that we might come in to fellowship. You've given us an eternal family to be around and to love, to pray for, to walk beside each other. It's those one another verses that mean so much to us because you've laid down your life for us, Father. And so, Lord, we want to lift up this night to you. We want to enter in to worship to the very throne room of heaven and look at your face, knowing that you have a throne of grace and your countenance toward us is favor, no longer condemnation. We thank you for that. We thank you for sending your son. So, Heavenly Father, we ask tonight that you would be in just enthroned in our praises, in our thanksgiving for what you have done in and through your son, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome here tonight. Be enthroned in the praises as we give you thanks for everything that you have done as well. Sanctification, setting us apart. So Father, have your way tonight. Bless us as we bless you in this way. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening once again. You guys ready to worship the Lord? That's all you got, huh? All right. Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. Oh, you are faithful, and you will ever be. We will praise you all of our days. It's for your glory we offer so raise your hands, all you nations, shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord most high. Where you send us, God, we will go, you're the answer. trust you when you call our name where you lead us we'll follow all the way so raise your hands all you nations shout to God all creation how awesome is the Lord most high raise your Shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord most high. We will praise you together, we will praise you together, for now and forever, how awesome is the Lord most high. Sing hallelujah.
creation shout to God all creation how awesome is the Lord most high sing hallelujah we're singing hallelujah oh hallelujah how awesome is the Lord most high oh hallelujah oh hallelujah how awesome is the Lord most high amen <laughs> how awesome is the Lord most high that's an old Chris Tomlin song, and I love that song. I don't know. There's a worship song I don't love. Come to think of it, you guys can have a seat if you'd like or remain standing. The only thing that the Lord requires of us, does anybody know what God requires of us during worship? Okay. Where were you a couple Wednesdays ago? All right. No, that we worship in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. And yes, it has to do with the heart as we talked about, but standing, sitting, kneeling, face first before the Lord, he wants us just to give us, give him our hearts in adoration and praise and sing to him and pray to him and shout to him. And, you know, we talked about just... Um, uh, laying before him and not caring what's going on around us as we worship him. So that's my encouragement tonight. Amen. Oh, come thou fountain of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song and sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, Mount of God's redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to Like a fetter by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of earth. Come now, found. Come now, fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain. Upon it, Mount of God's reach. 
redeeming love. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, the mount of God's redeeming love. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. <laughs> There's no other name that changes our hearts. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. There's a lot of people now that I've heard a lot of different weird names lately. But you know what? The name of Jesus is the only true, living, powerful name. That name is like no other name. There's little G gods all over the place, right? Sometimes we make ourselves little G gods. Man, but Jesus is a name above all names. He's the God of possible, the God of impossible. Jesus over you in your hurting in your sorrows I will ask my God to move I speak the name cause it's all that I can do in desperation I'll seek heaven pray this for you I pray for your healing the circumstances will change I pray that the fear inside would flee Jesus' name I pray for a breakthrough What happened today? I pray miracles over your life In Jesus' name Jesus' name Speak the name of all authority Faithful to keep I speak the name No grave could ever hold He is greater He is stronger He's the God of possible I pray for your healing That circumstances would change I pray that the fear inside would flee Jesus' name Oh, I pray for a breakthrough what happened today? I pray miracles all your life in Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Whoa, come believe it, come receive it. Oh, the power of the Spirit is now forever yours. Come believe. Come believe it, come receive it, oh the power of the Spirit is now forever yours, come believe it, come receive it, in the mighty name of Jesus all things are possible. Pray for revival, a restoration of faith. I pray that the dead would come alive in Jesus' name. Oh, I pray for revival, for restoration of faith. I pray that the dead would come alive in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
Amen. All right. Come on down, children. Grab your instruments of warfare. If you could stand with us, that would be awesome. Now, I combined two songs here, so bear with me. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great and how awesome is He Together we sing God, we just pray for these children, Lord, that you would help them this evening, God, just to hear from your spirit. We speak the name of Jesus over them tonight. Teach them your word, Father. Teach them who they are in you, Jesus, tonight. Bless all the teachers, Lord. We love our children, but we know, God, we could never love them as much as you. So pour your love out upon them tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we've only got a couple announcements, I think. Not exactly sure what we have here. Um, first of all, um, do we have any first-time visitors or guests among us tonight? Among us? No? We're all family. Amen. So, um, next Wednesday, we are going to have more comfort food. I know that tonight was chili and cornbread, and it, 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 was, it smelled so good. Um, so next week, let's do like a, like a soup and bread and salad. Bring your favorite, right? That's like a comfort food, right? So uh, looking forward to that. Still grandma's recipe again, especially for homemade bread. Andrew does homemade sourdough bread, so does my wife. Uh, this coming up Sunday night, we will have uh, the prophecy service continuing. Pastor George will... Uh, be teaching that, so we invite you guys to come out. And we have a sledding trip. Is that the day before? 
Is that the third? I think it is. The sledding trip. We found snow. Or we didn't find snow. Someone found snow, right? And uh, so they're going to go up and uh, play in it. Uh, I believe it's going to be 8.30 here at the church. They're going to take off in a couple of rigs, or I learned that from Brian, rigs, uh, cars, I call them, or pickups, and uh, go find some snow. So I'm learning the lingo, Brian. And then that Monday night, we will be continuing our fundamentals of faith. We're going to be looking at the Trinity on the 5th at 6 p.m. Come out and join us. And then we have another men's breakfast, I believe. Right, Jerry? Pastor Jerry is going to be uh, putting that on. It'll be at 10 a.m. February 17th. So men, come out and join us for a beautiful time of fellowship, food, and the Lord. And in February, we're going to be having another movie. Um, it's called The Climb. It's a wonderful movie about uh, a Christian that meets pretty much an atheist and has an impact on his life, and it's a great movie. Come out and see that. Um, and I think we have one more slide. Yes, again, uh, <clears throat> we do have the tithe statements available. We'll have them available again this weekend, so you can uh, come out and see uh, either myself or my wife in, during the first service or our treasurer and elder Dave and his beautiful bride, Kathy, will be making those available to you this weekend. So um, meet us in the gate. With that being said, um, Brian, would you lead us into another worship song? Thank you. again. We're filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath 
the living waters Such a marvelous mystery our voices. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You Well, it's at this time that uh, I would like to bring up Pastor Jerry. Uh, I've known Jerry for I've known Jerry for over a decade now, and he's more like a family pastor than any pastor that I've known. So, uh, please give Jerry a welcome applause. Thank you. Now, you may want Pastor Aaron back up here in a minute. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you know, gosh, those lights are bright. <laughs> uh, we get to talk about something that's very dear to my heart. And that's love. That is God's love for us and our love for him. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight in 1 John. But before we go there, <clears throat> I'd like for you to get to know me just a little bit. Uh, besides being clumsy um, and falling on, on, slipping on rocks. And by the way, um, so a week ago last Sunday, if anybody didn't know, I was outside, um, not intending to slip, but I walked up above and slipped on a boulder and landed on my tailbone. And then I went into shock. And so... That's never happened before. That was interesting. But uh, Sue's sister called, Pam, and uh, she asked me, she goes, why does God allow these things? And I already knew the answer. When I was out on that chair, the first voice I heard was Callie just saying, Jerry and Jerry. And she was stroking my hands. And then all of the people that were around, the love that they have, the care and the concern. And then for my bride to be at home, and then for Linda to give her a text saying, you know, Jerry would like you to be here. And um, so she pulls in, and there's an ambulance in the, um, in, the dry, in the parking lot. So obviously she's going, what did he do? You know? <laughs> What did he do? Anyways, no, she didn't think that. But, she, you know, the love that she saw with the people coming out to meet her and to pray with her and to pray for me, that is what we saw in this church. That's what we saw with you, is God's love for us that he has placed into you. That was amazing. So... Um, so anyways, besides being clumsy, by the way, I have new shoes, so <laughs> I hang on to stuff a long time, so um, the shoes I was wearing I had back in about 2000, um, so I used to wear them to work, so they're in the trash, <laughs> praise God. Anyways, so I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and I grew up in Southern California, uh, L.A. area, San Bernardino, Rialto, that whole area down there, for the most part. Um, and it was great growing up in that time. 
I mean, no offense to car lovers of today. They had cars. They had rocking cars. They had, I mean, and they were, the cars had identity, you know? You, we drive down the road and we see a little, little um, um, white kind of a vehicle. It's a, um, um, oh, just a, I don't know what name is, what's that? No, not a T-Bird, no. <laughs> no. No, we, we see like uh, just four-wheel drive cars, all-wheel drive cars, these little SUVs. Suburb. Suburb, no, not a Suburban, SUVs. <laughs> so anyways, back to my point. We see these little cars and we go, wow, is that a, that's a Honda or a Toyota or a Chevy or a Ford or what is that? Because they all look the same. They all look very similar. Well, back then, if you, if you drove a Mustang, Everybody knew it was a Mustang. If you drove a Corvette, everybody knew it was a Corvette. Cars were unique, and I love that. And so was the music. The music was incredible. All of these bands coming out, all of the songs. <clears throat> and I say this because I'm tying into what I want to say tonight. One theme that was so common in the music, you find a lot in the titles of the songs. There was a word that was often in song titles growing up in the 60s, and that word is love. So we're going to do something a little different tonight. This is going to be audience participation time. So here we go. By the way, I, I did that. Um, I'm really proud of myself. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to do slides. So here we go. Don't know how this is going to work, but this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to come up with the beginning of a song title, and then somebody in the audience can tell me the rest of it. You ready? First one. She? Yeah, who said that? Oh, you got it. Beatles. She loves you, right? These are song titles that all have the word love in it. You ready? Here comes the next one. There she loves you. When a... Hey, you guys are right on. When a man loves a woman, you got it. Next one. To sir? Yeah, you got it. Now we're rolling. Let's go. Where did our love go? Hey, who did that one? Supremes. Amen. Okay. Next one. This guy's crazy. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> crazy in love. I don't know about that one, but let's go with this guy's in love with you, right? Herb Albert, you got that. Excellent. Here, how about this one? What the, what the, love, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. You got it. How about can't? Buy me love. We got a Beatles fan back there. Yeah, here we go. Can't buy me love. Love makes, yay, hey, there you go. Now you're right on. Everybody, sometime, you got it. This neck, sometime, <laughs> okay, we'll talk. So the next song, the next song is the shallowest love song that was ever written, and you'll see why. It goes, hello? No, no, not uh, goodbye, that doesn't have the word loving. Hello? No, not hello, love. Hello. Who said that? Hello, I love you. Written by the doors, right? What's the very next line to that song? Hello, I love you. Won't you tell me your name? That's love? Hello, I love you. What's your name? <laughs> Anyways. That guy's crazy. So, and then the last one is all you need is love. And that is the end of the slideshow. Thank you very much. No. <laughs> um, so, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, they wrote that song. And they saw the problem that many people saw in our world, the need for love. There wasn't enough love. And you know, today is so much worse than it was then. So much worse than it was then. They saw the problem, but what they didn't, what they failed to see was the true reason and the solution. 
They didn't see that part. And that's where it falls short. The world always falls short. Always falls short. God never does and God never fails. So tonight we're going to talk about, if we get through all of this, love, knowing, being known, fellowship, and relationship. Those are the things we're going to talk about. Before we go there, though, I love worship. And Brian, thank you so much. It's, it's just beautiful to hear you worship God. <clears throat> there's, there's a song that really is very dear to my heart. It's, it's written by a Christian artist, um, a Christian artist named Kim Hill. I don't know if, every, if anybody's heard her before. Uh, you can check it out, check this song out. I'm not going to play it and I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to read the lyrics, lyrics to you. This song isn't really a worship song for like a, a fellowship, but it's my worship song in my heart because I see so much of God in this song. And these are the lyrics. I'll put it up there. I don't know if you'll be able to read it much. Huh. <clears throat> it goes like this. All alone underneath the stars, I wonder if the shadows will ever go away. Where are you? Are you very far? I feel you drawing closer, holding me as I pray. When I read this at home, I don't always get through it, just to let you know. I've heard that you are all around me, bigger than the sun, and they say that you know everything I do before it's done. Can you see me in the dark, feelings I hide? I hide, secrets I keep, and every dream I treasure. And can you see inside my heart, tears I can't cry, places I fear? I hope that you can find me here. I close my eyes and I think of you. There's comfort in the quiet, knowing that you are near. Can we walk, can we talk till the night is through? I love the way my heart beats when you whisper in my ear. Do angels come from far above to stand around my bed? Do you really stop to count how many hairs are on my head? So can you see me in the dark, feelings I hide, secrets I keep, every dream I treasure? And can you see inside my heart Whenever I cry, whenever I fear, I know that I, that you will find me here. So that's a glimpse into my heart because, and I got through that without one stumble. Um, thank God for that. Um, so let's see. God's desire. What is God's desire for you? to love you. He created you. He made you. His desire for you is to love you, to know you, and to fellowship with you, to draw you into a relationship with him, to have an amazing, eternal relationship with him. That's you, and that's me, and that's what God desires for each of us. So tonight, we're going to read in 1 John chapter 4. But before we do that, let's pray. Oh, Father. Father God, our Papa, our Papa, we thank you, Lord, for your holy presence always in our lives. Lord God, all the wonderful, wonderful promises, aren't, none of them are as wonderful as you are. For each one of them is a part of you. And each one of them describes you. But you are far greater than every promise written. You are far greater than that. You cannot be limited, Lord, in any way. And nor can your love be limited for us. It is amazing and wonderful. So, Father, our prayer tonight is for your spirit to move in our hearts, to open our hearts, to receive from you what you have given to us, what you desire to give to us. Lord, we love you and praise you. In your holy name we pray. And all of God's children say, amen. So, turn with me to John chapter 4. 
This is called God's love, the more excellent way. Chapter four, verse seven to 21. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Be loved. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and he hates his brother, he is a liar. And he, for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Pretty clear, I think, in all of that. Pretty clear. Let's take the first, the first verse, uh, verse 7. Let me um, open my Bible since I was reading off the screen. Okay, I'm getting used to this stuff. So, beloved, <clears throat> let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. <clears throat> Excuse me. The very first word that John uses is what? Beloved. Beloved. Other version says, dear friends. Dear friends. That's what he's calling you. Beloved means you are loved. You are the one that is loved. How did John refer to himself in his gospel? The, the one whom Jesus loves. He's passing that on to you. He's saying to you that you are the one that Jesus loved. You are the loved. Isn't that incredible? I love that. That is how God addresses you. This is how God sees you. This is how God sees others also. He wants you to see others as he sees them, and he wants you to see yourself as he sees them, as he sees you. Love one another is the next verse. It says, love one another, for love is of God. The first and most important trait of a believer is love. It is love. And it, it is not your love. It's the love that the Holy Spirit places in you. If you are born again, if you are a new creation, a new heart, then it is the Holy Spirit that lives in you. And I always know a person who's walking with the Spirit. I always know a person who is walking in fellowship with God because they love others. 
They love others. That's how you can see. That's how you can see. Because God is love. So, um, and what's amazing is, if you are part of God's family, I know for me, I look like my dad. He's in heaven, praise God. But I look like my dad. In fact, from the backside, if you take a picture of my backside, this bald spot right here, I, I can blame my dad for that one because he gave it to me. So, because I inherited it from him, right? We have similarities with our parents. We look like or act like our parents. How many people grow up and, and, and they said, I'll never say that, I'll never do that. And then when they have kids, they're saying the same thing as their parents said. It's like, where did my dad come from? So we are to act like our parents. God is our father. God is our father. And it's so important for you to know the character and the heart of God. Because when you know that, you can walk in that. And you can be like him. Because you are his child. You are his child. You are the one that he loves. I love the verse that, I know, I think it's the New, New Living Translation. You are God's masterpiece. Grab a hold of that one. Look in the mirror and go, I don't know what God sees. <laughs> I don't know what God sees. God sees the work he's doing in you is already finished. That's beautiful and that's wonderful. Our love for each other, by the way, reflects our spiritual father. Does God, is there, is there anybody that God doesn't love? Is there anyone that God doesn't love? No. No. Therefore, if I'm going to be like my father, I have to walk in love for each other, for everyone, everyone. Sometimes people are a little challenging to love. Um, anyways, but this, this grows in us. This, this relationship with God it has to grow. You are the bride of Christ, right? You are the bride of Christ. Now imagine a husband and a wife Okay, our son just got married in October, and it was a blessing to me because he asked me to do the ceremony, and uh, it was a, a wonderful time. So, um, after the wedding, after all of the prize, uh, presents and the people and everything, then they go home. Now imagine this. So they sit down at their table, and the wife sits down, and she begins to talk with the dad, with the husband, I mean, to talk with him. And... She shares things, her hopes and dreams and all this stuff, and he's sharing. And after about an hour and a half, she says, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I forgot I have to be someplace. I have to go. I'm sorry. I'll be back. And out, she, out the door she goes. Okay. That's kind of different. So a day or two goes by. Three days, four days. A week goes by. Pop, she comes back in. Hi, honey. Sorry. It took longer than I thought. But I'm here again. I have an hour and a half. So let's sit down and talk some more. What's the point of that? How much time do you give to God? For me, there was a time in my life as a believer in Jesus Christ. I went to church every Sunday, hour and a half. But I didn't always open this up when I got home. And I didn't always pray. And I didn't always fellowship. And I didn't always worship. I had a struggle with that. And it wasn't until God got a hold of my heart for me to fully open it to him that I began to change. He began to change me. I can tell you this. If a wife and a husband spend an hour and a half a week together, it's not going to last. <laughs> It's just not going to last. It's not going to work. It will not work. You need to live with a person to get to know them, to have a relationship with them, to grow together. There are many times when my wife and I, I can almost finish her statements because I know her and she knows me because we've been together for so long. So you get to know one another. That should be our relationship with God. It really should be. And guess what? That's what God desires, is for you to be so close to him that when God starts to speak, you can finish it. Wouldn't that be awesome? 
Amen. So, let's go on. Um, John 13, 35. Just highlights this, how important this is, about loving others. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Is there anyone, again, like I asked, is there anyone God doesn't love? God loves the most despicable person out there. He created them. He loves them. He doesn't love what they do. He doesn't love how they act. But he loves them. And that's what we are called to do. That's what we are called to do. Um, Lovelessness, if you don't love, lovelessness is godlessness. Think about that. Lovelessness is godlessness. No love, N-O, no love, no God. No love, no God. Sometimes it's hard. Well, we'll get into that. Let's go to verse 10 in our, in our, um, in our reading here in uh, 1 John. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. I love this. Look at that. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. God, God's love is always first. God calls you. God reaches out to you. He doesn't want anybody to miss. He wants, doesn't want anybody to die. He wants them to be in heaven to celebrate with him forever. God's heart, right? Um, consider these verses. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And God draws us. God draws us to him because his heart is that none should perish. Remember. And I will raise him up in the last days. God's heart is that none should perish. None. John 6, 65. And he said, and this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. Who does the Father love? Everyone. God loves everyone. And so God desires that relationship. For many are called, but few are chosen. For many are called. God calls, but not everyone says yes. Not everyone opens the door. I love this one. This is my favorite verse. One of my favorite verses. I have lots of them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. I will come in and dine with him. He knocks at the door of our hearts. Every heart. There isn't one person that's going to get to heaven that's going to say to God, you didn't knock. Every person God knocks on. Every person. Unfortunately, sometimes, you ever see those little peepholes in the doors in motels? Sometimes instead of opening the door, the door, we peep through that hole. You ever notice that it doesn't give a very clear vision of what's on the other side? You can see if, if there's somebody there, but it's not very clear. God desires for you to open the door when he knocks. God desires for you to open the door to your heart every day. Because every day is a relationship with God. If you invite him in. There's lots of times when we are too busy and we're off doing this, we're off doing that. God calls you to open the door of your heart every day, fully wide open. Take that little safety chain off. You know that little safety chain, remember that? Where you open it and it, like, you can peek through a little bit and see who it's there. Take the safety chain off. Don't look through the peephole. Just grab the door and wide, wide open and see what happens in your life. Because what's going to happen in your life is what God wants. And what God wants is always better than what you want. It's always better than what you want. So, in verse 11 to 14. It says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his Holy Spirit, his Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. You know, Brian sang a song early on, and one of the lines was, I had to write this down. I have the worst memory sometimes. You're the answer we want the world to know. What the world needs now is Jesus, real Jesus. That should be the song. You're the answer we want the world to know. And that points us in that direction. But we'll get there. So, God gives us, by the way, at the beginning of this, in verse 11, what's the first word? Beloved. That's the second time John has used that in this short section. Beloved. Dear friends. The one that Jesus loves. The one that God loves. That's you. Right? So he's he's telling us that's for us. Our love for others is caused by God's love living in us and through us. Say that again. God, or our love for others, that's not from you. It's from the Holy Spirit. Our love for others is caused by God's love living in us and through us. It is in response to his love for us that we give that. So his love in us is what comes out through us. And what I love about this is, if you look up and it says in, um, in verse 12, God abides in us. What does abide mean? To live. To live. Listen to that. God abides or lives in us. And what does he say after that? And his love has been perfected in us. His love has been perfected in us if we live in relationship with God. If you don't have relationship with God, you can't reflect the love that God wants to perfect in you. It is already perfected. Can you get more perfect love than God's love? Can you find more perfect love than God's love? And and so God deposits his love into your heart, into your life. He brings that love into you. And now God's heart and desire is for that love to be shared and given to others. You know, there are two big bodies of water in Israel. There is the Sea of Galilee. And then what's the other sea? The Dead Sea. So what flows into the Sea of Galilee? The Jordan River. What flows out of the Sea of Galilee? The Jordan River. What flows into the Dead Sea? The Jordan River. What flows out of the Dead Sea? Nothing. Nothing. Do you see that? Right there in Israel, God gives us a picture of our walk. When God flows and and when God places his love in us and it flows through us, it's a blessing. The Sea of Galilee is alive with, with life. But when God deposits his love in us and we hold it and don't give it out, then it's dead. Not only that, but if you look at the talents, um, the three guys who were given the talents, 10, 5, and 1, what did the one with one do? He hid it. He kept it in. He didn't use it. He didn't put it out. And what he had was taken from him. God gives each of us his Holy Spirit. It lives in you, but it's designed and it's for you to share it with others. We're going to get to how you do that. It's very critical to know how you do that. So God lives in us. I love this. Now, what does this say? I want you to catch this. It says, um, if we love one another, God abides in us. Is that a condition? Yeah. If you love one another, God abides in you if we love one another. 
God's very own spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. His spirit in each of us. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If we indeed, we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. I thought a lot about that, that um, if we suffer with him, if we suffer with him, we're going to get into a verse in a little bit, but the verse that comes to mind is when Jesus says, if you want to be what my disciple, what do you have to do? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Those first two things, and the third, it's going to involve a lot of suffering. The cross itself, people say that. I mean, I wear a cross right here. I have one on, and my wife has one on. Um, and I've worn this uh, for decades uh, because it reminds me of what he paid. But some people say the, say the phrase, well, I have to bear my cross, you know? And we've heard that done kind of, you know, jokingly like, oh, the company is going to send me to Florida for a training session. I have my cross to bear. It's going to be tough, but I'll get through it, you know? But what was a cross for when Jesus was alive? It was for, not just for death, not just for death. I'm getting ahead of myself, but praise God. Not just for death. That cross was to show complete submission. This is a person who was convicted of a crime and sentenced to death, and he has to carry through the town or through the region his own means of death. That is the Roman government absolutely having dominion over that person, right? That person now has to carry that cross and submit completely to the authority of the Roman government. When we carry our cross, we are submitting completely to God's authority in our life. And that's the only type of relationship that I can have. That's the only type of relationship you can have is when you submit completely to God's authority and God's presence in your life. God has a purpose and a plan, but you have to submit to him. So, I'm going to come back to that point. We'll probably not say it again, so praise God. <laughs> so, um, his spirit in us and our love for each other is a major part of Jesus' plan for evangelism. Who in here would like to win souls for Christ? I'm, I'm serious. Raise your hand. And if you, have, if you don't have your hand raised, check your heart. Who in here wants to win souls, bring people to Christ, let them know how good God is? Who wants that? Who wants to share God, share his love with people? Amen. Then Jesus tells us. He tells us exactly how we can have the world see him. Are you ready? John 17, verses 20 to 23. Now, by the way, let me go back for a second. Don't read that. Um, <laughs> I love you guys. I was going to start off with a prayer that you would show me mercy, but I know you do. <laughs> Amen. Um, John chapter 17 is, if you have a red letter Bible, the entire section is red letter. It is, God, it is Jesus praying to his Father, that entire chapter is Jesus praying to God, praying to God for him, for himself, for the world, for his disciples, and then for us. And this is the part where we get in his prayer for us, for you and for me. In verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, those meaning the, um, the, uh, his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, 
that the world may believe, what? That you sent me. See that? That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and what? And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. There is evangelism. Do you want the world to see Jesus? They will see Jesus when we love one another. They will see Jesus when we are united, when we are one. We are not one because you're the same color, you have the same color of hair I do, or I, I had. Um, it's changed. Um, you, we're not one because we're the same gender. We're not one because we're the same height, or we're the same weight. What makes us one? The Holy Spirit. We are one, what does it say? One in the Spirit. Does the Spirit live in you? I hope so. Does the Spirit live in me? I know so. And I hope you know for yourself. And when the Spirit lives in you and the Spirit lives in me, and we follow the Spirit, we have a relationship with the Spirit, we have fellowship with God, when we do that, I have an immediate relationship with you. Why? The same spirit in me is the same spirit in you. I can love you as God loves you. You don't have to be perfect. Um, newsflash, you're not. <laughs> and neither am I. None of us are. But God lives in you. And God lives in me. And that's what I draw near to you with. And that's what you draw near to me with. I love it in Colossians where it says, and I like the NLT version. Love one another. Overlook one another's faults. Okay. You may not know this. You can ask Sue. I have faults. <laughs> I have faults. I have faults. You put me behind the wheel of a car. I'm a changed man. I am, I am wicked, I tell you. There was a... There was a time we were coming back from, from Medford. We were pulling off at the, on the south entrance to Grants Pass. And we, I was pulling over to turn. Uh, we were going home, I think, but I was pulling over to turn right there where Dutch Brothers is. And so I was, I was in the turn lane, three, three cars, four cars in front of me. And so the light turns green. And we know what that means, right? Right? Sometimes people need to be reminded, but we... so. We start to go, and the car in front of me, it's a Subaru. Nothing against Subarus, okay? But it's a Subaru, and it's just like... And my first thought is, you're going to make me catch the light. What are you doing? Right? It's like... Come on, do you need a little help? I can push you. I got a good bumper, you know? <laughs> so we get about, I get into the intersection. Once you get into the intersection, you made it, buddy. Okay, you're going to get through, okay? So, but then they turn their flashers on. Oh. Oh, God. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Again. <laughs> How many times now is that? Seven times 70? Oh, God, I'm an idiot. Again. So they pull over, and I go past them. It's a young girl. I don't know, 18, 17, 19, young girl. And uh, I pull past them, and I said, I'm going to pull over. I'm going to pull into the, the parking lot there where the restaurant is. Uh, but not Abby, is it? Not Abby. Applebee's, that's it. See, memory problems. Okay, so I pull in there, and then she pulls in, and she parks in a handicapped spot because, you know, it was barely running. And I get out. Boy, you could smell oil burning. And uh, so she gets out, and uh, 
it's like, so she goes, I don't know what happened. It just stopped. And it's as far as I can get it. So I said, okay, well, let me, um, let me look inside. Let me take a look. I turned on her ignition. And anyways, I'm not going to go through the whole story. That'll be 20 minutes. Um, her mom pulls up. And, uh, but she was just a young girl that had car problems. And my first reaction was not one of gentleness and kindness. So God help me have your heart for all people in all situations, even behind the wheel of a car. So, amen. So, anyways, gosh, where was I at? Praise God, I love that. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so, let's just move on to the next slide. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, it'll come to me. No, it won't. You have better faith in me than I do. <laughs> About three o'clock in the morning. Ah! Give me all your emails. I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> um, so anyways, we are called to show that kind of love for each other at all times, in all ways. So, um, amen. God has a plan, and you are part of it. I know that for, for a fact. Um, by the way, the word perfect, perfected in verse 12, it means, that's back in, in 1 John, it means to finish or to complete or to bring to God's desired outcome. Our love in us, we are being perfected, finished, brought out to God's desired outcome. You know, I love the story of the, of the, the prodigal story in the Bible where you have the two sons. And we never focus so much on the second son. We always focus on the first, um, it seems like. Um, but you know, I got to thinking about that whole situation. There's some really good books out there written on, on that whole parable. Um, when the son was living in the father's house, Sin lived in his heart, but he wasn't sinning. He wasn't sinning. He wasn't living like that. It wasn't until he left the father and traveled away that he engaged fully in his sin. And then when he got to the end of that road and sin was no longer helping, no longer giving him what he needed, what he wanted, then he remembered. What did he remember? His father, the goodness of his father, because his father took care of everyone in his house. And that, what, that is the goodness of God is what draws us to him. The goodness of the father is what drew the son back because he sat there and went, look at me, I am miserable. I have wasted everything. I have, I have ruined my life. But if I go back to my father, and I apologize, and I ask for his forgiveness, and I ask just for him just to hire me so that I can be fed and have a place to live. So he heads back. And where is the father looking the entire time? Right where the sun left. When the sun disappeared over the horizon. Because when the sun came back, the father saw him right where the, he, the last place he saw him, he saw him again coming home. And the joy the Father has to see you coming to him, the joy every day, that Father that ran out to meet him, that's God every morning in your life. When you stop and you say, Father, can I spend some time with you? That song that I read in the, in the beginning, she just wanted to spend time with him. Father, can I spend time with you? You know, he, you know, he runs to you. That's God's heart. That is God's heart. I don't like this. Uh, I don't like the use of this particular word, but in this case, I want to use it. In that way, God's heart, God's love for us is reckless. God is not reckless, but his love goes to no bounds, no ends to come and meet us. That's his heart for you. That is God's love for you. 
Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, praise God. Verses 15 and 16. Let's read those, please. Verses 15 and 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, get this, God abides in him, just like it said earlier, and he in God. What a wonderful truth. Look at that. So whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and you abide in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. That's that favorite verse. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. If you live your life in love, God will live in you. This is about love, everybody. This is just about love. This is not about pursuing knowledge. This is about love. If I have all knowledge and have not love, if I do everything right and have not love, what did Jesus say to the group in Matthew chapter 7? the group that goes up to him in heaven, I think it's seven, and they say, but didn't we do this? And they called him Lord, 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 Lord. I think, George, was it George that said this? Anyways, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these miracles in your name? And what does Jesus say? I never knew you. That's Jesus saying, I never had a relationship with you. They knew Jesus, they knew about him, and in their thoughts, they thought they had a relationship with him because they did things in his name, but there was no love in what they did because God is love. And if God is not there, there is no love. Not the love that counts. So it, they do things and they don't have love. It matters not. It doesn't matter. The first thing you do is love. You love God. And then you love others. And then God will fill you with his spirit leading and guiding you as you develop your relationship with him. As you develop your relationship with him. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said this again. This is talking about that. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, there's a word I'm going to give you, and it's a new word. I'm jumping all over the place. Praise God. There's a new word I'm going to give you. Okay. God desires fellowship with you, right? He desires you to have a relationship with him. He desires fellowship. Here's the new word. It's not in the dictionary. In order to have fellowship, you must have fellowship. In order to have fellowship, you must have fellowship. You must be following God. You must be seeking God. You must be looking to God. And when you do that in your life consistently, when you do that in your life, you will have fellowship with God. And what does Jesus say? He knocks at the door, right? When you open the door fully and invite him in, he begins to live in you. That's what it means when it says that I come in to sup with you. I come in to sit down and dine with you. I sit at the table with you. In Jewish culture, that was like your family. You're, you know, come on in, right? Come on in. So when you have fellowship with Jesus, then you can have fellowship with him. But that requires those two parts, denying of yourself. Did you know that Jesus showed us how to do that? Jesus showed us how to do that. Um, skip those, sorry. Um, Jesus showed us how to do that. Uh, let's see. Um, it's in, I'll just go to it. I'll read it to you, I don't know where it's at. But, um, this is in Matthew chapter 26, and it's in verse 36 to 39. Then Jesus came with them 
to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. That was James and John, right? And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father. I imagine him saying, Oh, Papa. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What did his flesh want to do? What did Jesus' flesh want to do? Stay alive, not die on the cross. But it, wasn't, it was far more than that. It wasn't just the death and the scourging and all of that. He also knew what grieved him the greatest, what should grieve us. He was separated. He didn't want to be separated from his father. He had never been separated from his father. He and the father were one. And now the body that he had was going to be fully separated from God because he took on the sin of the world. He was absolutely sinless. He was perfect. And he took on the sin of the world, yours and mine. And God turned his back on him. That's why he said on the cross, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? In that, Jesus asked God, if you look at it, he says first, he says, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But then he denied his flesh himself. He denied himself. And he said, not as I will, but as you will. And what did that lead to? Him bearing his cross. He denied himself. What he wanted. He denied what he was afraid of. He didn't want to go there. He didn't want to experience that. But he said, not my will. Your will be done. And that's what we are called to do in our life. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. That's the denying part. And then, you know, we'll go from there. So, I can see already that I didn't get through nearly as much as I wanted to. Praise God. I you know I did this at home. I've never spoken in front of a group like this. I mean, we have home fellowship, and that's a great conversation, and we have, um, oh, men's groups, things like that. It's a lot different. But um, it was, so I, I did this at home, and it was 47 minutes long. No, it's not. So. No, it's not. So... Praise God. What I would like to do, though, what I would like to do is to close with a few comments without going through the rest of the verses. Um, and this won't take very long. What does this all mean? So, we have looked at God's love for us and our love for Him. And how this is seen, the world sees God's love by our love for each other. God, they don't see God. We don't see God. But they see the evidence of God. They see the love of God. They see the goodness of God. What drew me to God? It wasn't his righteousness. It was his goodness. Because I heard that he loved me. And he had a plan and a place and a path for me. A reason for me. And I went to him. That's what I did. And that's what the world needs and longs for. We need to show them the goodness of God, the love of God. But they're not going to see that if we're bickering and biting each other. They won't see that. We need to love one another. We need to walk in grace and mercy with one another, to forgive one another. As Colossians says, to overlook one another's faults. Forgive. How? As Christ forgave us, we are to forgive. And then that's completely. And by the way, the worst thing for me to do, I can forgive, but I don't always forget. 
I don't always forget. And every day I remember it, or every day I see the person, I forgive them again, and again, and again, and again. Even if they don't do that again. If I think of it, no, God, I forgave them. And then I treat them as if they never did it. And that comes from the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit in you. You can't act like that and you can't be like that. And that's why when I know, I I know a person is walking with God because I see God treating others through them. How do they treat others? If they do it like God, then they are walking with God. If they do it like the world, then they're walking with the world. I don't care if you sit in church. I don't care if you call yourself a Christian. You're not walking as one. If you're walking in the world, you will treat people like the world. And that's not the way to live. So um, this is about God being in you. And then you being in God. That's that relationship. You can't be in God if you don't open up his word. That is Jesus. Everything in in God's word is Jesus. You cannot be with God or in God if if you're not in the word. So, you you must be in his word. This is, so, um, back to this. It's about relationship with God and then relationship or fellowship with each other. And all of this is true only if God lives, God's spirit lives in us. So, um, it comes through being in the Bible every day. It comes through talking to him every day, making time for him every day, and being in fellowship with him and his family, and in praising and worshiping him. But it first begins, and it only begins, it can only happen when you open your heart to him completely. And then you do that every morning. You rise in the morning, and you say, Father, here I am. Allow me to come to you. I want you to come to me. Remember when the prodigal came over the hill? The father ran to him. Ran to him. That's God's heart to you. Come to him every day. He's right there with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He is always there. Always there. So come to him. Come to him. Thank you, everyone, for your kindness and listening. And we are going to have... uh, We're going to have Brian come back up and sing worship. I do want to offer an opportunity if anybody has anything to... For prayer, if they have any praise, if they have anything they want to share, if they want to just come up here and talk to God, God's right here with you. He's right here for you. If you want to come up, there will be pastors and elders here for you to come and talk to. Or just come up and talk to God. Come up and talk to God. He desires you. Make the move. Walk up. Say something. Because he longs to hear from you. And when you do, when you invite him in fully and completely, he will change your heart and your life forever and ever. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your heart for us. We thank you for your word that shows us your heart, that shows us your love for us. And Father, I love that there is, like in Romans 8, I was going to share about that, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And at the end of Romans 8, there is no separation from you, from your love. So Father, we thank you for your love. May your love live mightily as your spirit lives mightily in us. Father, help us to lay our lives down, to deny ourselves, to invite you in more and more every day so that, Father, we would become less and you would become more in us and that you would use us and change us, not for this, just this world, not to be used just in this world, but to be used by you 
for all of eternity. Father, we give you our lives, we give you our hearts, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, and all of God's children say, Amen. you guys. We love you. Go out and love somebody.